Welcome to the Dental Implant Practices Podcast, where each episode will explore how to integrate dental implants into your practice and into bone with your host, Dr. Philip Gordon. Hey guys, thanks for being listening to the show. Go to dentalimplantpractices.com and find all of our resources. Also find us on Facebook, Dental Implant Practices page on Facebook. And go to iTunes and leave me a review on iTunes so we can help spread the message. Thanks. Welcome back to another episode of the Dental Implant Practices podcast. I'm your host, Philip Gordon. And today, it's a huge honor for me to introduce Dr. Mark Bashara. Mark, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, Mark is a uh, DDS general dentist um, who works up in Ontario, Canada, hosts the uh, implant page on Facebook, Canadian Implant Dentistry Network, and is just a, uh, a, a good friend of mine that we've met at the Dental XP this year. And so I uh, wanted to have Mark on the show and talk about all the things he's doing and talk about his career and some of the papers he's written. And uh, we're going to cover immediate implants today and um, kind of some educational pathways. So uh, Mark, thanks for being on the show. And why don't you tell people kind of some of your background getting into dentistry, uh, you know, where you did your education, some of your implant training, and, and what all you're doing in your private practice. Perfect. So I graduated in uh, 2010 from the University of Western Ontario, and I've been in practice for eight years now. And I was fortunate enough to have met my wife, who is also a dentist, and uh, her father, is a dentist as well, who's been placing implants for over 30 years. And he was one of the early people in the Toronto area to have uh, done some studies with the early implants, like the, what is the name of that implant with the pores in it? It's... Uh, oh, the blades uh, or... Yeah, blades and also that one that had that, those little micro pores in them. The name is slipping me by now, but I'll remember it later. The point of it is that you know, he was a, a good mentor to have, especially for my early implant training and having someone beside me in guiding me in that pathway. You know, it always it always takes a good mentor and, and a guidance. You know, I, I joined my uh, father's practice right out of school, so I had a good mentor uh, for dentistry, but he wasn't necessarily um, into implants. So I think, you know, you get into in dentistry, it's good to have a good mentor just to get you up and going, and then you have to find, you know, kind of your passion. So your passion is implant dentistry. So you graduated in 2010. Tell me about some of the uh, educational pathways that you've taken for um, implant dentistry. I'm not sure about in Canada, but you know, in the United States, we didn't have a lot of time and clinical experience when I graduated in 2009 covering dental implants. So most of it for me has been, um, you know, after graduation, CE learning, you know, what, what pathways have been good for you? What have you done that's been a big deal for you? Well, for us here, we need uh, a minimum number of hours to be able to place implants uh, on patients. So I took a uh, a curriculum based on Dr. Mish's teachings, and it was taught by a prosthodontist here, uh, Dr. Mark Lynn. So he had set up a curriculum of uh, hands-on uh, hours in CE, along with uh, with you know the educational background you need to get into implants. But that's just kind of a, a stepping stone into the implant world. After that, like I was saying, you need to have somebody beside you to guide you, and that's where having uh, you know, my father-in-law to guide me in that path. And then leading into the online world, you know, I discovered uh, Dental XP about five years ago and joining that has been a tremendous help because of the, the number of leaders throughout the world that you can talk to, even chat with online on Facebook, ask them questions, post cases and kind of uh, ramp up your your skill that way. So that's been a great help for me. Absolutely. There's, there's a lot of communities online now that, that make a big deal. I know you lead one of those uh, communities. Uh, tell me a little bit about how the Canadian Implant Industry Network started and um, what's going on with that um, and, and kind of what where, where the future holds with that. So for me, I found it when I'm talking to colleagues here and I'm showing them cases what I, uh, that I'm doing or techniques that I'm developing and they'd have questions and they'd say, where did you learn that? So I thought, you know, as much as I think that there's certain uh, uh, outreach right now happening to maybe U.S. doctors, it wasn't happening to the same level on the Canadian side. So I thought by creating this forum that we can bring all the Canadian doctors and even we have a lot of international doctors on there and share about what the latest and uh, newest techniques that could be out there 
and have it in an open discussion forum where it's not necessarily uh, you, you, you must attend a course to uh, hear what the speaker has to say. So I think that's kind of the new trend in, in learning is, uh, you know, open group learning and kind of it follows that same model of uh, what Dental X, XP has started, but on the Canadian side of things. So this was a project that I started uh, actually probably about a year ago, and it's taken off uh, tremendously, and uh, we're, we have upcoming uh, courses and speakers that will be coming uh, from the U.S. side to Canada to kind of uh, lead us into new new ideas such as digital dentistry, especially in the implant world, digital smile design, all sorts of things which I think on the Canadian side are still lacking. Uh, we're always I think behind in that sense and getting uh, those kinds of educational opportunities. You know, it's it's good that you've created a, a platform for those people to learn and grow. I think uh, you know those those kind of things are are invaluable. You know, the the group uh, collectively is is better off than just the one solo. Uh, but sometimes it takes someone to kind of help nurture and lead that. So I'm, I'm glad that you're doing that. Um, it's you know a great resource for people looking to learn implant dentistry from other people that are out in the field doing it in, in a way that. Um, you know, kind of, kind of embraces people in all, all walks, you know, it's, it's people that are learning and, and people that are advanced kind of throwing their ideas in there and kind of seeing what happens. So it's, it's, it's a real great thing. Yeah, for sure. And what we've done is, uh, over, uh, over this year, I've kind of handpicked people that were experts in certain areas and I've asked them personally to contribute content to the group. So it may not be the same kind of cookie cutter stuff that you see out there in courses, but at least it opened your mind to uh, new techniques that are in development or things that may you may not even see out there being taught regularly in, in, uh, in your everyday CE. I think, you know, it's not to say you should do all your learning from Facebook, but if you have a good background and, uh, and basic training and implant that is something to add to what you have already developed and kind of take your training to the next level and doing it in a much faster and uh, economical way also because not everybody may be able to travel. Yeah, I, I like to look at it as a nice supplement uh, or, or a peer um, kind of, you know, uh, base, you know, to evaluate, okay, this guy's doing this, this guy's doing that. I mean, obviously, it's not where you want to get the foundation of your knowledge, but it's kind of a a sneak peek into what other people are doing in their practice and tips and techniques that you can learn. Obviously, you know, you need to learn the, the, the uh, basics and the skills, you know, in a more formal setting, I believe, but there is, there is a, there is a part into the uh, learning and sharing um, that, you know, the internet has, has provided us and the technology has allowed us to share, you know, pictures and videos now that in, in a way that um, has really opened up the educational learning opportunities. So it's, it's great that that's uh, that that's out there, and you're contributing to that. Tell me about where you practice at. You uh, you said you live in East Toronto, I think uh, is what you were telling me in a in a town called West Bowmanville. Kind of tell me about your practice situation. So we have we have two practices. The one in Whitby, where I live, is uh, my father in law's and my wife's practice, and I have my own practice 15 minutes east of that in Bowmanville. Bowmanville and Whitby, they're not large. Uh, towns like Toronto. So we live east of Toronto. So Toronto would be kind of the main uh, or the well-known name in Ontario. So Toronto, uh, much lar larger than Whitby and Bowmanville. Bowmanville, for example, is a small town of about 35,000 people. But I found in my uh, previous time working as an associate is that if you work in these small town settings, the the kind of relationships you develop with people tend to be much closer. And I found that people were actually more open to treatment in, in, in a small town setting versus uh, having to be in a, you know, in, in a major hub. So what's your thought on it? Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, you know, I live in a big city like Kansas City, but it's, it feels kind of like a big, small city since we're in the Midwest. You know, the people are down to earth. And, um, um, you know, so we still have resources to, um, all the big city amenities, but I, I, I agree if I would have to kind of pick over, I would, I'd be more on the outskirts of town, but, um, you know, the wife doesn't want to live out in the country like I do. So, you know, we're in the city, which is fine. Uh, and, and I love it, but you know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's a great place for, uh, you know, these smaller towns and these, um, small town practices, because, you know, one, you can uh, financially do really well. 
in there. Um, two, um, there's just kind of a better uh, relationship because it's it, it it's a more kind of old time relationship. When I think about you know you you know you go in you 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 see the familiar face. You know they 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 trust the care that they're getting and 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 everyone is happy with with the way things are going. And unfortunately nowadays there's um, you know a lot of back and forth with dentistry and patients and you know lawyers and there's just there's a lot of a lot of issues that can be developed with uh, complex care. And so, um, yeah, the, the small town's the way to make it, if you can make it work. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, uh, you know, working in Bowmanville and uh, living in Whitby, it's been a blessing that way. Obviously, uh, it is less expensive to be in a small a smaller city, but also in terms of what we can offer, we're not cutting back on the kind of, uh, you know, service that we deliver. So, I mean, we've been doing digital uh, scanning, for example, for implants and crowns for six years in both offices. And we do most of our implant treatment and most services in office. So, I mean, for me, it's been kind of uh, a positive to be in that kind of environment because we're not competing against major centers such as uh, in bigger cities. Well, that's great. Um, so let's talk about some implants here. I know... Um you place a lot of implants. You like to you like to do those kind of cases. I know we were going to talk about the immediate the immediate extraction case today. Um, so whether that be the anterior and posterior, we can kind of break those up into two different segments because I know those are kind of different animals. You know, the immediate extraction is something that is becoming more and more common with teeth in a day or just speeding up these recovery times for patients. People don't want to wait, you know, a year for their tooth anymore. Um, we we have osseodensification burrs. We have piezoelectric instruments. So we have a lot of tools at our disposal. And uh, and also we've got a lot of implants to choose from now. We've got a lot of aggressive threaded implants. We've got good bone grafting materials. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of instances that can call for an immediate extraction, immediate implant placement, and or even immediate um, uh, temporization. So kind of walk me through um, some steps here when, when to consider uh, as far as, you know, how do you want to start off this? You want to start talking about with the uh, how to extract, you know, which, which different um, sockets are the best, you know, what different types of implants are the best, and then where you want to break it up anterior and posterior and just kind of walk through some some different steps. Sure. So let's, I mean, for me, this is one of my uh, favorite topics, and we've even published on it with uh, Dr. Gregory Kurtzman, based out of Maryland. And uh, in the posterior zone, we always split up the classification of the sockets into type A, B, and C, according to Dr. Tarnow. And, uh, you know, what's unique about these cases is not every case will look like the other case. So every case you encounter will be slightly different and your approach will differ. So in a type A or B socket where your uh, septum is still intact, you're able to get the implant in the septum and your implant in a type A socket will be fully contained in the septum. In a type B socket, it will be partially encased in the septum, but not fully housed in the septum bone. And a type C socket is when you could take out a tooth and almost uh, has no septum at all, looks like a, almost like a giant uh, crater. And in those kinds of cases, you have to abort placement or use an ultra-wide implant, which I used to do, but I'm kind of uh, steering away from uh, placing wide implants nowadays and more into narrower implants with uh, either a conical or more taper or cone more taper connection. So, and, and especially in type A and B sockets, like you were mentioning, there's a lot of great tools out there like the identification birds that are used to uh, help preserve the bone for getting that primary stability and just taking your time with that extraction. Uh, but I like to use, I know some people use piezo devices. For me personally, I like to use uh, these really thin, long, fine diamond birds from Brassler and gently go around the root in a mesial distal paddle direction to loosen the roots very slowly and preserve as much of that bone as possible. Um, what's been working in your hands, Philip? Yeah, you know, I like to, um, a lot of times I will uh, section teeth and then um, in, in the posterior and then use some periotomes to uh, kind of just wiggle out the roots. You know, I don't want to uh, do what they taught me in dental school, which was just, you know, grab the cow horns and start going back and forth as hard as you can. Um, I think, yeah, you know, like you said, delicate extraction of the tooth. However, that is best for you. Um, um, you know, I, I like the periotomes and, um, 
if I can cut the cut the crown off and 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 then split the roots and then flip out those little root tips easily, um, you know, I can I can do little damage to the surrounding bone, and then you've got a good chance at at that immediate placement. Um, I like yourself. I don't like the the big ultra fat wide implants because I think uh, once you get some bone resorption, you know, you may be looking at trouble there. I like to put the implant kind of in the same spot whether I do immediate placement or delayed. So I want the the implant in the ideal spot. Um, so yeah, I like to, uh, I like to get the, the roots out either way, like you said, just as nice as possible. And then, and then start evaluating that socket and kind of where to go from there. Yeah. I mean, I've done it in some cases where we've used the roots as a guide, drilling through the root, then taking out the root. But most of the time I'm aiming to get the root out and then evaluating the, you know, the morphology of the area to see if I can stabilize that implant or not. So in most cases, though, I mean, I always tell the patient, you know, I can't promise I'll get the implant in in one shot, but we'll do our best with it. And obviously using uh, systems with an aggressive thread design helps. And uh, in my practice, I'm using a combination of systems. Now I'm using uh, the Neodent implants, which have a, an aggressive thread pattern very similar to the Nobel Actins. And those have been helpful in uh, achieving a high primary stability in a lot of the cases. And I use them also in uh, full arch cases as well. And um, their connection I found has been, uh, it's basically a cone Morse uh, taper connection. So I know uh, on your uh, on your Facebook page, people are mentioning about conical connections and internal hex connections. And there's an argument about Morse taper connections and whether, uh, you know, what is a Morse taper versus a cone Morse taper and, and this kind of back and forth. But um, the neodent implant, it's a cone Morse taper connection. So it still does require a screw to hold it in place, but it's been shown to have very little uh, lateral movement of the abutment. So in, in my hand, that's that's a plus, especially if you're going to use a smaller diameter implant. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good um, kind of tapered connection implants out there now that have a strong connection and allow us to not have to rely on um, an oversized implant for the strength. And I, I, I think that's a critical thing because then we can look at, okay, let's get uh, a nice size implant in the right spot and not worry about it being super wide or super fat to have a strong connection. Um, let's, you know, let's worry about getting good bone around it and good emergence profiles. So. Um, you know, let's assume um, some of these molar teeth come out nice. You know, we've got upper molar, lower molar, uh, lower premolar, and upper premolar. Where where do you like to, where do you like to um, put these implants? If everything comes out well and you've got nice septal bone, you know, what's your what's your go to position on the upper lower, you know, uh, molar premolar area? I never want to just use one of the sockets to place an implant. I've seen some cases where people on a lower molar will place the implant in one of the sockets and you'll have a cantilever effect, but also it's going to be real hard to get a nice emergence profile of those kinds of cases. So if you can get the implant uh, in a prosthetic position to get the, uh, you know, right in the septum of where that, uh, you know, that screw access channel is going to come up, the occlusal aspect, it's better to stage the case. Same thing on the upper. So I think if, if you do that and place it in one of the sockets and, you know, you have cantilever effects or food trap issues. It's better to stage the case and come back. Yeah, I think that used to be the uh, technique that was taught many years ago. You know, just put it in one of the sockets and uh, and you'll be in good shape. But I, I think we moved away from that. I think, yeah, putting the putting the implant underneath the restoration in an ideal spot, you know, usually means putting it right in that center furcation, that furcal bone. Uh, and, and, and if you can't do that, then yeah, we may need to graft and come back. I think the only time I might feel comfortable with putting it in a sock. It might be, uh, you know, an upper first premolar. If there's a, if there's a buckle, uh, and lingual root, maybe putting it in the lingual root and grafting the, uh, the facial, but that, that'd be about the only time. Cause even on those, you, you, uh, you know, you may have to do some guidance. Um, what sort of instruments do you like? Obviously, you know, you've got to make a good, um, uh, you know, purchase point in those. And then, and are, are you using a lot of the Densa burrs for that? Is that your kind of go-to burr for these cases? So you're not, grinding away good bone? So I use a combination of things. So if, assuming I got my tooth out, I've sectioned the crown off, got the roots out with no flap, and 99% of the time, no flap is raised. I'll use either um, 
my pilot drill, or I can even use a high-speed diamond to create my initial uh, uh, guiding point because you're going to find, especially in thin septum areas, once you uh, start switching to your regular drills, it's going to have a bouncing effect from socket to socket. And you're going to want to push down with finger pressure on your uh, on your uh, on your drill to prevent it from skipping into the area of least resistance, which is even common in in the upper anterior. So I found the use of the densification or versa drills really helpful in these cases because once I've engaged my implant in that septum, I don't get that bouncing effect of the drill jumping from one socket to the next. So this has been a really helpful tool in bone preservation, uh, especially in immediate, because I don't have to lose that bone, which is sometimes as little as three, four millimeters, if that. And if we lose that, I can't stabilize my implant or I have to use a much longer or wider implant. So in these cases, I can get away with placement of uh, four or five millimeter implant of 10, 11 millimeter length and still get high primary stability. Yeah. And that's fantastic. I mean, I, I think you covered it, some good things there. I mean, like you said, not raising a flap can be a critical deal in these. You know, you don't want to uh, disrupt the bone and the, the tissue as little as possible in these cases. And then also, um, like you say, kind of preserving the bone too, uh, with, with, uh, the, the techniques you're talking about, you know, those are kind of important things for the healing and the outcome of the case. And then are, are you coming back? Are you going to graft some of those sites around it? Um, in an ideal case, you know, if, if you've got those, um, sockets, um, Will you will you graft those remaining sockets, or or what have you got um, for that technique? I've, uh, early on, I tried it in both ways. Some people say you don't have to graft the sockets if you have a certain thickness of your uh, buckle wall, especially. But I found that you know I will ninety nine percent of the time graft the sockets. Now, even though they say that that's not necessarily you'll have to, especially in the posterior. First, you get less. Uh, bone resorption, you're going to get more of an intimate contact between your graft and implant, but also it helps to maintain the soft tissue profile, even in, on posterior regions. So that's still a big factor in, uh, in grafting, not just necessarily for the heart tissue, but also to maintain that profile of your soft tissue, because you're going to get resorption either way but it's also to maintain that soft tissue profile. Yeah, I think that's important. You know, like you said, I, I like to grab those those uh, gaps too, even if um, it's not for the bone. I think it's to keep the plumbness of the soft tissue, just so there's not a collapse of some things there that, um, uh, you know, aren't aren't creating any negative effects for the final outcome. Because I, I think that's why we're doing the immediate, is so we can get a shorter time to treatment, but we can also get a better outcome. And I think that's, you know, what we're going for. Um, so I, I do like to grab those as well. And then um, how are we covering those things up? I mean, obviously, if we're talking about a molar here, we got a big hole back there. Um, you know, that's that's half the battle, too, is is how do you keep everything in place? OK, you've got, you know, this implant there and, and it's not as it's not a big fat implant like it used to be. So it doesn't obliterate the socket. Um, you've got some grafting material. Are you um, suturing, a, you know, anything over there? Or are, you, are you trying to put temporaries? Are you trying to put uh, healing? types of, of covers over there what what have you got up your uh, sleeve for tricks with that so I, and you've probably seen this online so i mean I, i'm a big uh, believer in using prf in my practice when we published a number of papers on the use of prf not just for soft tissue healing but the, in the use of prf uh, around implants especially media cases and one technique is to use the the prf membrane to basically punch a hole through the PRF membrane and to drape it over that socket to protect your graft material until you get that soft tissue ingrowth underneath it. And that has worked out quite well, especially if you don't think the patient's going to be able to keep it clean. So it's, it's a nice material to also mix with your bone graft for handling. So if, if people are not using it in their practice, I'd recommend to get into uh, using that. That's great. Yeah. Anytime you can incorporate the PRF uh, in, and like you kind of talk about the poncho technique where I guess you're putting uh, the the healing abutment over that and having that drape over the uh, socket and then maybe throw in a couple sutures just to tie everything down and 
and you're good to go there. Is that is that kind of what you do for most of your cases on if you're not doing an immediate temp? Exactly, yeah. So in those cases, either you can use the healing abutment with the poncho technique, or if your primary stability is questionable, put a cover screw and uh, make a PRF plug and put a figure eight suture on top of that. And it, it, it heals quite nicely at 10, 12 days when you have your patient back. It's helped with the soft tissue healing rate. Yeah. Okay. Now let's kind of let's kind of jump up to the uh, anterior zone. Is there um, how are we approaching the the anterior? Let's let's call it anything uh, in in the smile zone. How, how are we approaching these different? You know, maybe eight or nine, uh, or, or I, I don't know what you call them up in uh, the Canada with your different uh, numbering system. Uh, what do you? Uh, what about these anterior teeth? I mean, I mean, I know. Um, you know, we have to treat things a little different. You know, we've got a very thin facial bone. It obviously kind of depends on the defect, but let's just, let's just assume, you know, we've got good socket. Um, you know, how, how are we directing the implant? How are you starting those? Um, are you doing any socket shield, uh, techniques, partial extraction therapy? And, um, you know, probably you're going more to an immediate temporary, uh, crown on those. Um, so kind of talk to me about how, how you switch techniques in the interior zone a little different. But I think in the anterior, especially, it's important to take a CBCT. So in the posterior, if there's teeth present, I'm not necessarily taking a CT scan every time. But in the anterior, it's helpful because the trajectory of those teeth can differ so much. And if you're going to try and engage the implant in the paddle direction, you want to see how much room you have in, able, in order to get that uh, uh, implant in place and also the crown to be potentially to be screw retained. Uh, so especially taking that CT scan will give you an idea of where to make your cuts, especially if you're considering doing partial extraction therapy, which is basically removal of the root, but preserving that buccal fragment in order to maintain the PDL. And that's a technique I've been using for the last two years in my practice, and I use it selectively in upper uh, anterior zone and all the way up to the premolar zone where you have adjacent implants. And it's not a technique for starters. It's not something you want to try on a Monday morning after seeing it on the weekend. But it's, uh, I think it's a technique which has a lot of value in the anterior zone. And I know, Philip, you've used it also in your practice, correct? Yeah, you know, I definitely... Uh... I'm trying it out. I, I'm not the first to, uh, you know, break into any of these fields. I, I like yourself, uh, you know, follow some of the kind of the, the guys that, that are cutting the path here. And I just want to be the one that, um, you know, can I bring it into the general dental practice? Um, and I, I think it's a, a very technique sensitive deal, but it's um, gaining popularity with the results that it's getting um, with soft tissue and bone management. But um, yeah, it's, it, you know, definitely like you're talking about that, 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 um, those, those, um, you know, those parameters up front change based upon the angulation of the uh, implant and the restoration. You know, I, I definitely um, don't try to put any sort of temporary crown in the back when I do an immediate implant, but um, definitely anything moving forward I do. Part of it is because I don't want a flipper rubbing around, and part of it is I'm trying to develop that soft tissue profile, um, and, the, and the patient usually wants to leave with a fixed tooth. So, um, you know, I, I like to try to get an immediate temporary on every time in the front. Um, it helps, helps hold in the bone graft that I pack around it. it helps, helps contour the gums. Um, now, whether or not I do socket shield is very uh, case by case dependent. For sure. I mean, not every case will be a candidate for it. You know, a lot of the cases we can get away without using it because we have adjacent teeth to hold that bone profile. But when you get into cases where you have multiple adjacent implants, or, you, you, or you've already placed an implant, now the tooth next to it is going to go. Those are issues because as, you know, as atraumatic as your procedure may be, you will have bone resorption now on that uh, implant next to it. But it's not, like I said, for every uh, case, and you need to have uh, either an in-office CT scan or get one done to evaluate if it's a good candidate for uh, doing this kind of procedure. But back to what you're saying about the immediate temporization, that is the best way to kind of preserve that profile. And I was uh, kind of looking into unique products that are coming out. And I was uh, fortunate enough to 
be in touch with a periodontist in Greece who had been kind of struggling with, uh, you know, doing surgeries for patients and sending the referrals back to the doctors who, you know, getting that are getting their cases back in a healing abutment. Basically, the lab guesses as to that soft tissue profile. And then you either have implant crowns that are under contoured, over contoured, and you start to get into issues about how to maintain that soft tissue profile. So I think that's kind of, you know, as important as getting that implant in the right place is, you know, maintaining that soft tissue profile. Yeah. I, you know, the soft tissue is, can be the biggest part of healing because uh, because without adequate soft tissue, the bone uh, can't survive. So I, I think, you know, it's, it's just as important to become an expert in soft tissue management as it is bone management when talking about implant dentistry. And so half of these techniques uh, are in, you know, directing of, of the soft tissue as it is much of, of the bone stability as, as soft tissue stability will, will maintain bone stability and vice versa. So it's, it's definitely something to keep eyes on, on both the hard and soft tissue. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you, you know, the implant placement is, is, uh, is important, but I think the, the soft tissue development is, uh, is so crucial to these cases, and which, is, which is something, you know, often is, you know, the training is uh, people starting out in implants may not be uh, number one on the list to do. But then when you start placing implants and you see cases where, yes, you can get the implant in, but your soft tissue is lacking, and then you run into issues later on. So um, one ex- product I am excited to try out, and I think it's coming out to market very soon, was these custom emergence profile healing abutments. So the idea is to take a circular healing abutment, which is what we're used to, and be able to replicate the tissue profiles around implant crowns, whether it's in the posterior or anterior, back to what nature gave us. So I know some people will make, like you said, chair side temporaries for uh, immediate temporization. Some people will make custom healing abutments. But to have it in a standardized way so that your lab can replicate it is the next step. And that can be uh, an, an easy way to ensure you get a crown that has a nice emergence profile replicating what we started with without worrying about what the lab's going to give us, if it's, if it's sufficient or not. Yeah, you know, so um, exactly. There's there's lots of different ways to heal tissue now and these these. Um, Emergence profile kits that are coming to market are, are definitely a good way to look at that. Um, and or, you know, there's there's these preformed um, temporary uh, shells that you can buy for the interior. And so there's there's a lot of creative ways to kind of get to that end result. So it just kind of comes back to, uh, you know, shaping the bone, shaping the tissue and, um, you know, getting predictable outcomes. Um, any other tricks or tips that you've learned with uh, the immediate extraction case that you think we haven't covered yet? Uh, it, tricks. I mean, I'd recommend for people to, uh, and I can put it online or uh, send you the link for it, is to purchase this, uh, like I said, this uh, burr from Brassler, which is, it's almost like uh, your needle diamond that you use to finish your composite restorations, but in a very long uh, 10 to 12 millimeter uh, shape. And that's been very helpful in removal of teeth without removal any of any bone. And also for people that are getting into implants, it's good to look at the prosthetics and work backwards. So if they have digital scanners in the office or if their lab has uh, PBCT and uh, any kind of uh, digital acquisition software, look at the prosthetics and work backwards. And being able to, uh, you know, have a stent made for surgery uh, is helpful, especially for people starting out. So, I mean, I'm not necessarily using it on all cases, but in certain cases, working backward from the prosthetics is always a good start. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anytime you, you're starting one of these projects, you, you need to be looking at, okay, where are we heading? What's the final prosthetic outcome? What is the treatment plan? How can we move forward, um, you know, based upon that kind of work your way back to the surgery, you know, what do we need to do for soft tissue emergence? What do we need to do for bone quality? And so, um, yeah, any little trick can help, you know, so I'll, I'll get a link to that burr 
um, and some of the other things that we've talked about. Yeah, one more thing too is, and I know we've, I've seen people ask me a, a number of times online, is how deep do you place these implants? And, you know, especially in the anterior versus posterior, the rules will differ. Where I mean, in the anterior, we're aiming to be about three millimeters apical to the CEJ, the adjacent teeth. Uh, in the posterior, I like to use, as I, I often will use the septum bone as my reference because that usually works out to be at the correct level of where I want the emergence of that implant crown to be. And often people say, isn't this place too deep? But you have to remember, you need enough running room for your crown. Otherwise, you'll end up with crown that is uh, almost looks like a tomato on a stick is what I call it. And you'll end up, end up with food trap issues and not give your lab technician enough running room to create uh, a proper emergence profile. So just kind of being able to visualize at the time of surgery how deep you need to place your implant. It's something to keep in mind, uh, but the septum is always a good reference in most cases, especially in the posterior zone. Yeah, it's a little different than when you're dealing with healed bone. You know, with healed bone, you might be looking at at or slightly below bone level in, in the immediate. Uh, in the posterior, you know, you definitely need to sink them in a little bit. The septum is a good reference point. You definitely uh, want to be below your, your lowest, you know, buccal lingual walls there. Um, as far as height, but in the anterior, you know, it, it's all about where the adjacent CEJs are. Um, and, and you definitely need to be burying those implants, like you said, for um, establishment of proper emergence profile and, um, you know, to get the, to get the right crown, um, you know, prosthetics in the, uh, in the delivery zone. So you, you definitely need to pre-plan these things. That's where some of these planning uh, guided softwares come into handy so you can know, okay, here's where the final outcome is going to be. Here's our depth and then kind of work back from there. So it's, it's definitely a good good thing to have all that um, planned out ahead of time. Yeah, it's just it's just you know important to get down to proper depth when when placing those so that you have uh, you know the proper emergence there for your crown and and ultimately get a great outcome. So, um, any other major major points that we didn't hit for the um, immediate implant? For me, I've I've been uh, digitally scanning my cases. So uh, you know, if people are getting into implant dentistry, I think that's kind of the next step if they have if they don't have a digital scanner in the office and and they are able to make that kind of investment i think that's been a, a really helpful tool to also have because you can uh scan your implants uh, at time of surgery and the lab can also make you nice temporaries at time of surgery so i'm not sure if you're using that currently or not but it's been a helpful tool for not just implants, but crown and bridge uh, implants. It's a nice uh, adjunct to your practice. Yeah, I, you know, I've got them in one of my offices, and I'm going to be adding it to uh, my office uh, in in this spring sometime. So uh, it's it's finally come time for me to get that next step for that investment. So I'm going to be doing that this springtime, so I can upgrade some of these um, revelations there there that we have with the digital dentistry. So um, yeah, definitely, you know, the the merging of the information and the technology uh, workflow is, is kind of demanding it nowadays. So you used to be able to bypass it a little easier, but with all the, the futuristic things that we're doing, um, kind of important to have in the office nowadays. So I'm, I'm definitely gearing up for that. Any recommendations you have on those? I'm using the iTero in, uh, in my office. I, I know the iTero and the, the trios have been uh, two of the leaders in this field. So they're both, you know, highly respected uh, product. It just depends if you're getting into other avenues like, uh, you know, aligners, things of that nature, uh, but both work well. It just need, You need to also make sure uh, your implant system that you're using has a digital library support for it. Not every company out there may, ne may necessarily have that. So it's something that, you know, doctors starting out especially if they're using lesser known brand names, they, they should check with their lab and lab technician as to the support of that system. But for most big companies, you know, that's already out there. Yeah, absolutely. It's always good to check with your uh, labs and or supporting teams to say, okay, is, is all this software available? You know, you don't want to make a big purchase investment and realize, okay, I can't use the trios with, um, you know, uh, Invisalign anymore, or my lab doesn't have the 
uh, scanning abutments for XYZ implants. So you, you always want to make, make sure that the workflow is there before you pull the trigger. Um, yeah, I, I love it, Mark. It's, it's been great chatting with you. I know we're at about the, uh, the time frame that I, I told you we'd keep it. So I will direct people to the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network, and we'll get a couple links to some of the things that we've talked about. Um, what's on your agenda for this year? What's on your, what, what's the big thing you're excited about for 2018? I know we, we talked at the dental XP symposium. Um, that's been a couple months ago. We're already into March. So what, what's the rest of the year got for you? What's, what's exciting for you this year? So the big exciting thing is, uh, the launch of our digital dentistry mastership program. And in a month time on April 14th and 15th, we're having uh, Dr. Marco Tadros, who's uh, a prosthodontist at uh, Garber and Salama's practice in Atlanta. And over the last four years, he's developed uh, basically a digital dentistry residency. And we're hosting him here for our module one on April 14th. And it's going to take doctors from basically the ground up in the digital world all the way up to how to design complex cases in free-to-use software. So I think this is going to be something that will not just take off in the States, but in Canada, because like I was mentioning, this is kind of uh, the change that's happening in, in, uh, in dentistry. And it's kind of the future of where things are headed. So we're excited to host him. Uh, in about a month's time. That is exciting. I, you know, I got to meet Dr. Uh, Marco at the uh, Dental XP convention too. So, seems like a great guy. Really knows his stuff, and uh, and I'll be interested to see uh, how that goes for you. And maybe we'll have to get him uh, to one of our our group learning events too. So, um, look forward to seeing you again sometime. I know you come down for all the major CE, and maybe I'll make it up there at some point. But um, it's been great talking with you. We'll get things up and going with this, and. Um, Make sure we're, we're promoting your site and doing everything we can for you. Like I said, it's been great talking with you again, and I know that we'll have you on again someday. So um, hope you can enjoy the rest of your day and uh, get back out there and keep keep placing those implants and, and sharing on your group. I, I love what you're doing and, and really appreciate all that you're doing. I appreciate, for, I appreciate you for having me on here and also for your uh, leadership online and uh, for sharing uh, with everybody online. And one more thing is, what if people can look into getting this is the Ostel or Penguin unit for their office. That's been a great addition, especially for pri uh, primary stability on cases. We can touch base on that on a different day, but uh, thanks for having me. Phil. Sounds good. Take care, buddy.